Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Super excited to have you on uh, for our next uh, session of Active Pipe Insider Industry Insider series that we've been doing. Um, We've been talking to a lot of interesting people in the industry, hearing their takes on what's going on currently, what the future looks like for real estate, all those kind of great stuff. Today, we have a really cool person on, personal friend of mine, and a really great guy in the industry, um, Zane Burnett. He's been on, in many different spots in the industry, uh, previously head of technology for Lon Pinnell, uh, now head of tech for Willis Allen Real Estate, um, and also builds a lot of technology of his own in the industry. So. Very all around uh, good guy, but also knows a ton about the industry, knows a ton about technology in this industry, and especially about data. And so today, what our conversation is gonna be about, really, is what data tells us we're doing wrong in real estate. This comes down to, on the marketing side, you know, with our websites, with our social media, with uh, you know, all different parts of what we're doing as a brokerage and as agents that we could be doing better, that we might not realize that old practices that worked in the past might not be working now and how the data actually backs that up. So excited for this conversation. I think it's gonna be a lot of interesting stuff that uh, you might not uh, realize is the case and hopefully we'll teach a lot of interesting new things on this conversation. So Zane, thanks for joining. Um, one thing I forgot to uh, mention in terms of your background is Zane is also uh, a fantastic karaoke singer um, with a beautiful voice of Nickelback. Um, that's the best way I think I can compare it to, but you probably have, uh, more, more Eddie Vedder, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. We can, uh, when, when COVID uh, releases us from our confines, um, we can go back out and I can disprove that, that characterization. Happily. <laughs> yeah. For the record, we'll make sure to post a video, um, of some of your awesome karaoke, yeah. uh, along with this one. Um, along with that line, we uh, actually are recording this. So you will have the recording sent to you afterwards. Um, Cause again, there's gonna be a lot of interesting things we're gonna touch on today. So um, wanna make sure you have an opportunity to check it uh, backwards. So awesome, Zane, just to kind of get us started. Um, I know I gave a little bit of background, but can you talk a little bit about your background in the industry, where you are now, what you've been doing and some of the interesting stuff you've been working on? Sure. Yeah. Um, I've been in the industry since uh, 2007, um, which seems further and further away every time I say it. Um, most recently, as you mentioned, I was VP of digital innovation uh, at Alon Pinnell, which was at the time the largest independent uh, real estate brokerage in the country. Um, they were acquired by Compass uh, a couple a year and a half ago. Um, I'm currently uh, Chief Digital Officer for Willis Allen Real Estate, luxury real estate firm in San Diego, um, as well as Managing Director for uh, a small consulting firm called Ocapico. Um, I've served on the Board of Directors for the Big Data Program at Rutgers University. Um, so I have a lot of background on just that, that gray area between marketing and tech. Um, a, a lot of decisions, a lot of initiatives, uh, that that spe that focus specifically um, on the joining of the two, um, which is becoming increasingly important. I think, as everyone has become aware. Absolutely, as technologies become more and more of a staple in this industry and in brokerages, figuring out how to actually put that together, what data flow should look like, what is ideal for for each company with their particular needs, has become more and more important and more and more difficult. Especially all the new products entering the market. Yeah. Um, but today, a lot of the stuff we want to talk about is data and you, you know, you being part of the uh, uh, board of directors at Rutgers, you know, uh, for, uh, for you're talking about with the big data, yep. you have a lot of interesting knowledge coming from out of there. But we talk about big data a lot and data visualization. And I know you have a lot of opinions on, you know, that's kind of can be a buzzword. Sure. But, um, really, how should we be thinking about this? Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, big data and AI and all that stuff are, are, are a couple of terms that we're hearing thrown around a lot um, in the industry and just in the world at large. Um, and so I thought we could start by just um, providing some practical insight, a, a two minute primer on what big data means and, and what its intended purpose is. And so when everybody talks about big data or data analytics, um, the, the main goal uh, when studying that is to create actionable insight, right? Um, and that means be able to come to a point where we can intelligently look at data 
and make decisions that improve whatever objectives we may have regarding our own organizational units. And, you know, to get there is a process. You have the data itself, which can be categorized as either qualitative or quantitative. Um, quantitative meaning has to do with numbers, qualitative being observed. Um, and data in and of itself is not information. Data is raw, right? And from data, we extract information. So when you hear about data visualization or when you log into your Google Analytics, um, that is data presented in the form of information. Um, and then from there, you tend to, you want to look at context and you want to create insight um, so that you can create actionable items based on that insight, all with the goal of being able to more intelligently view the scope of whatever you're looking at um, and be able to make decisions based on data. You know, it's funny, a lot of times people say that data doesn't discriminate, data, you know, is absolute, and data in and of itself. It, that's true. It does not discriminate. It, it is absolute. However, as we just discussed, data is only the first part of that process. How it's collected can be influenced by the statistician. Um, how it is translated into the form of information um, can, you know, be skewed by whomever is, is compiling that. And obviously insight, which we'll talk about insight here. We have a couple of examples of, of the end, the end result of actionable insight. That is completely and 100 percent um, skewed by whomever is taking that data, compiling it into information, and then creating actionable insight as a result. Um, so I, I would challenge everybody. I mean, obviously, don't you don't need to go take courses on data or data collection or data analytics or anything like that. But at the very least, have a fundamental understanding of what the purpose of data is, because data in and of itself um, is useless. Uh, it has to be compiled into the form of information, which also in and of itself is useless until you create some form of actionable insight that you can act upon um, on the basis of that data. Right. There seems it's what's interesting is there seems to be this obsession in the industry with capturing as much data as we can. Right. The company that has the most data is the company that wins. But at right. the end of the day, you can capture all this data, but what you actually are doing with it, what insights you're taking away from it, how you're actually actioning on it is the very difficult part. And that's where you're going to see the differences between companies that are actually succeeding with it and others who are just might be hoarding data. As a tech company, a marketing company, it's the same challenge. We can capture as much data as we can, but are we delivering back something that is usable for the end consumer with that data? Or is it just all this raw material that we don't know what to do with? So when you talk about, you talk about when we've talked previously about different types of data, qualitative, quantitative, you know, how should we be looking at that? How should we be thinking about that? Sure. So um, if I can, I'll share my screen uh, real quick. I, I'll give you guys an interesting, I'll give you an interesting example of um, qualitative data. So uh, when I was asked um, to be on that advisory board for, you know, Rutgers University and their big data program, um, coming from the real estate field where there are tons of data, um, one of the big questions was, what can we, what can we do um, to harness the power of that data. And so this is more of a fun exercise um, that I did about a year and a half ago. And it was solely based around qualitative data, right? And qualitative data is, is something like, uh, again, non-numeric. So uh, level of education, um, you know, where were you born? Things like that. Those are all observable um, data facets and qualitative data can further be defined into ordinal and nominal, but we won't get into that. Uh, but one of the things that was really interesting was um, somebody in the program said, oh, uh, I, I heard that real estate agents get a bad rap, right? Um, which was interesting to me because, uh, I mean, certainly over the course of the last 13 years, um, I've heard, you know, good and bad things said about real estate agents, real, realtors as a profession, uh, various brokerages, things like that. So I said, let's study that. Like, what can the data actually tell us, right? So, uh the profession itself is, is a very, uh, you know, old one. Um, let me just see if I can. So what we had to do was take a look at some of the analog data, right? And obviously there was no internet, there were no computers, um, you know, back in the 1850s, but in order to get a full picture, we wanted to go back and the very first piece of data we found was in 1854, uh, where we see in American literature, the very first mention of real estate broker as a profession. Um, and it was about, it was written in a, in a Harper's Magazine story 
uh, about a, a real estate broker by the name of Stephen Halliday, uh, who is very just scrupulous and was trying to swindle uh, this family out of money. And thankfully, a lawyer was there to save the day, right? Um, and then anybody who's watched any Westerns, when you look at like post-Civil War, when they're expanding the railroad, I mean, storylines are filled with people like trying to swindle farmers out of their land so the railroad can come through. Um, and then, you know, moving forward, we look at uh, another story called The Talented Mr. Billfinger, uh, again, about a real estate agent who was scrupulous and sort of uh, morally ambiguous. 1922, Lewis and Claire writes a novel called Babbitt, which actually uh, was one of the main factors that contributed toward him winning the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, Babbitt, I mean, I'll just read. I have the first, um, in the sixth paragraph, I have it right here, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the book. It says, his name was George F. Babbitt. He was 46 years old in April 1920. He made nothing in particular, nothing better uh, for shoes nor poetry, but he was nimble in the calling of selling homes for more than people could afford to pay. Again, not the most uh, glorious depiction of, uh, of a real estate agent. Um, anybody who hasn't seen Glengarry, Glen Ross, fast forward 70 years. Again, not the most glorious portrayal of real estate agents. Um, and I'm, I'm fast forwarding through a lot here. All the way up to 2002, uh, anybody who's watched King of the Hill, so you can tell we really dove deep looking for data, you know, um, qualitative data that could give us an idea of the sentiment of real estate agents. Uh, season six, episode eight, it was in 2002. I won't bore you with the details of it, but it was interesting to me because at the end, um, it's all about this king at a Renaissance fair and he's so into it that he thinks the whole world revolves around this Renaissance fair and he ends up getting accused of something. And his last words, the last words of the episode as he's getting uh, thrown out of this Renaissance fair were, I'm going to have to go back to selling real estate. Right. So again, not the most glorious portrayal. So I got to thinking, maybe there is something here. Like culturally, we have almost a hundred years of negative sentiment. And then we go to 2009. Uh, we see two real estate agent characters in popular culture. One, Paul Rudd, uh, and I love you, man. And of course, America's favorite realtor, Phil Dunphy, um, who is uh, on Modern Family. And those are really the, the, the first two times we see the profession portrayed in a positive light, though not necessarily overtly positive, but at least these agents weren't scrupulous or morally ambiguous and things like that. And what was interesting to me was up until 2004, which was when Zillow and Trulia first came into play, real estate agents were primarily regarded as the gatekeepers of data, right? Like that was their job. They had to, people had to come to them to, uh, to, to figure out what was for sale and what was available with the advent of the internet and making public and uh, making data more and more publicly available. We see, we have seen the profession shift to being less of, of a data keeper or a gatekeeper to data and more of a professional service and somebody who's there to help, um, the individual or the consumer. And so you've mentioned Santa Clarita diet. We're seeing more and more portrayals of real estate characters, uh, in a positive light. Why is that important? It's important because we've established that there is a long history of negative sentiment. And now with the beauty of the internet and data, we can take a look at sentiment as it's measured um, when mentioning either real estate companies or real estate agents as a profession. Um, and, and so we've done that. And we looked at back then uh, several different real estate brokerages. Um, and what they had, what, what at the time they had what's called a sentiment dictionary where every word in the English language is assigned a sentiment value that ranges from extremely pleasant to extremely unpleasant. Um, and then there is, um, an emphasis value associated with it, whether that be extremely subdued or extremely active. So what we did was we started taking a look at some of these brands that are really big and that had a lot of search volume available where people mentioned the brand or real estate in combination with the brand. And here's an example of two that as you can see um, on this chart, there's really no negative mention of, of the brand or the profession. Um, they range in terms of how pleasant they actually are, but they go from neutral to pretty pleasant. And then we had two other examples that were the exact opposite, right? Here are two brands, and I'm not going to say what the brands were because I don't want to disparage or throw anybody under the bus, but you can see that here are two brands where there is extremely 
negative, an extremely unpleasant sentiment um, as characterized by the sentiment dictionary. And these are normal people just voicing out loud on the internet. This happens to be specifically a Twitter analysis, um, what their feelings were of this particular brand, right? And so we started to notice some consistencies with what was happening. Like why were some brands getting no negative sentiment and some brands were getting extremely negative sentiment. And so this is where in the process of analytics, you start to draw insight, right? And some of the consistencies and correlation that we found were the, the older the brand, the more likely it was that people were speaking negatively about it, right? The newer the brand, there were no negative mentions or there were very few. And so then we said, that's interesting. Um, and then we looked at the aesthetic of those brands. Some of them have since undergone uh, rebranding um, campaigns for, for their respective brands. But the aesthetic of the newer brands tended to be more in line with what the consumer demands and, and desires were of the time a year and a half ago, right? They had none of that baggage that goes back to the 1800s or you know, however long ago these, these companies were established. They, they had the advantage of being uh, established in the post internet world, right? So they could start fresh. And part of one of the things that we've noticed that they started fresh with was marketing standards, right? So when you look at a company and I'll use one as an example, because I know that it's probably one that everybody's wondering about, um, compass, right? The, the big elephant in the room of the industry. Um, I happened to work very briefly for them, uh, for a month, a year and a half ago, and got some insight and have since gained further insight into what their marketing philosophy and strategies are. And it is very strict. You will never see a Compass agent putting a photo of them from 20 years ago on their business card, right? Like that you will never see a piece of marketing material go out that does not strictly conform to the brand standards of the organization. Because what a company like Compass has realized um, whether directly or indirectly, is that there was an issue with the industry, right? There was brand inconsistency. There was this lingering sentiment of, you know, why do real estate agents do X, right? Some of those questions might be, why do real estate agents uh, post old photos of themselves where I can't even recognize them when I meet them at the house? Why do real estate agents send out marketing material that looks like it was made in MS Paint? And I'm not trying to disparage any specific uh, agent or firm, but it, it has to be said that when you compare some of what is allowed at these legacy brands to what is not allowed at some of these newer and established brands, um, there's a huge dispar uh, discrepancy there. Uh, and I think that you know the insight that we drew from that was that is what was one of the main contributing factors toward eradicating that negative sentiment because it was in line with today's standards of what the consumer expects. And um, we scoured, we found thousands of examples of marketing materials, um, you know, business cards online and things like that. And everything we found when it came to the, the brands that had a lot of negative sentiment, um, we found those types of materials. Um, so, you know, the, the hypothesis that we created in that session was that in order to be able to positively portray yourself to a public, especially if you're a, a legacy brand, you have to start um, raising the bar in terms of what you're going to allow your agents or your brand to be able to do. And I think that um, it's something that a lot of brokers strive for. There's a lot of hesitancy there because you're working with agents that maybe have been there for 25, 30 years. You don't want to upset them. These newer brands don't have that problem. The, the longest anybody's worked there is five, six, maybe 10 years. Um, and so the, the mindset is different. And as a result, they're able to avoid that negative sentiment. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a really important thing to note too, that it's, it's not necessarily that if you are a brand that's been around for a long time, that automatically you're gonna have a negative sentiment, there's nothing you can do about it. Right. It's really about the brand consistency, brand modernization. There's a concept also out there, especially in marketing, you know, what we do too, where brand consistency is extremely important, brand frequency is extremely important too. There's an idea of the mere exposure effect where the more that a consumer sees a brand, they tend to have a higher uh, affinity to that brand. Same reason why Coca-Cola still advertises, right. right? It's not that they're trying to get more people necessarily to learn something new about Coke, but it's a branding consistency. You always recognize that brand. 
and you see it all the time and it creates this this positive affect towards it so again if if, if you're an older brokerage and, and and you've been around for a long time it's not necessarily that's just how it's going to be you're going to have a negative sentiment and the newer ones have this advantage that you don't it's about that consistency it's about stepping up the brand it's about getting everybody on the same page you know there's tools that help to do that there's uh, uh, philosophies that help to do that. And I think it's important coming out of this is understanding, okay, with this data insight now, what does a company do to actually implement it? 100%. So you mentioned um, when you talk about the, uh, the data insights and, and the brand sentiment, you talked about Compass doing it well. When you talk about how companies can start moving more towards maybe some of the things that Compass are doing well, it's not necessarily just, hey, let's just copy the Compass model. Sure. There's some strategies that they can take coming out of this, this conversation and say, okay, how do we immediately start finding ways to create that brand consistency, to raise that sentiment, if we might find ourselves as one of these older brands uh, that it's possible we don't necessarily have as positive a sentiment? Yeah, I think, um, you know, first and foremost is d like finding out where your brand guideline is, your style guide. Um, if you're a brokerage that doesn't have uh, a style guide or brand guidelines, then um, everybody within your organization is sort of operating at will. Um, there is no standard to which they are expected um, to adhere. Um, if you do have one, great. If you don't, like make one. Hire somebody or go to your marketing and design department and build one. You'd be surprised how many brokerages, especially the smaller ones, don't have that. Um, once you do have that, do not be afraid to hold every single one of your agents or members of your organization accountable to adhering to those brand standards, right? Um, now, more than ever, um, it is important to be able to speak with a unified voice through brand. Um, and when you have, whether it's a brokerage of 50 agents or a brokerage of 5,000 agents, when you have um, some segmentation or fragmentation of what that voice looks like, you're diluting the power of the brand, uh, you're creating confusion, and inherently you're eroding trust because you, you, the consumer doesn't have that consistency. And I understand that it might be hard, especially with some of the older agents, but really it's a matter of, when I say older, I don't necessarily mean you know, in, in years, but just has been there for a while. Um, have a chat with them, you know, explain to them step one through five, why this is important and why it's important to speak with the unified voice. That is the power of the brokerage. That is the power of brand. And I think we're all realizing, uh, you know, that the power of brand, even in the real estate world is, is a very, very important one. Yep. I think this, this segues nicely into the next part that you have a lot of knowledge about is your website. Oftentimes is the face of the brand for many people in a virtual way. Um, and you have a lot of data that backs up, okay, how, how everybody seems to do their website right now. And maybe we're, th we should be thinking about it a little bit differently. How yeah, does that yeah. come to play here? Let me, uh, let me skip over the social, uh, part of this because I know we're running short on time. Um, we can start there too. Oh, we can start there too. Okay, cool. So I'll also, just, brief just to, uh, just to real quick, we're going to probably go to a uh, quarter till the hour. We're going to have a time too, where you can ask questions but feel free to put in questions in the chat box now and we'll make sure to, to get to those questions also. So I'll, I'll breeze through this one because I think the one following this is extremely important and it's a passion subject of mine. Um, you know, one of the things, and, and to be able to provide um, sort of some actionable insight to brands, uh, when we look at a study done by Agora Pulse in 2017, which is a year or two after Instagram um, introduced the carousel post, there was on average a 25% decrease in engagement for brands that were posting carousel posts, which is, you know, the images that you scroll through versus single image posts. And I think that a lot of brands either inherently recognize that or read similar studies. And so they said, you know what, carousel posts are out. We're not going to do that. Right. And so this leads up to the next uh, portion as well, because it's an example of something that maybe a brand has been doing because it worked at the time. Um, but when we take a look uh, at what's happening now, we did uh, a study and we gathered data on, I think it was like 27 different real estate brands. And what we did was we assigned an engagement score based on the post type. And we, we analyzed other ones too, you know, text only, video, image and text. But I want to point out specifically a single image post versus a carousel post because this is a very easy action item um, that is verified and supported by data. Uh, we looked at 27 different brands, some of them huge, some of them with hundreds of thousands of followers, right? And in some of those cases, some of them posted exclusively 
single image posts. Some of them posted exclusively carousel posts. Some of them mixed it up a little bit. What we found, and you can see in this little graph that we made as a result of that by assigning those um, engagement scores, is that over time, carousel posts consistently outperform single image posts, right? And so the whole goal of social media and outreach is to uh, yield engagement. And this is a direct representation of what engagement looks like across 27 real estate brands based on two different types of posts. There isn't a case that we studied, maybe it exists, where carousel posts did not outperform single image posts, right? And so the other thing we noticed was that over 40% of posts by real estate brands and agents have a question in the caption, right? Which bathroom do you prefer? Would you like to live here? Uh, you know, don't you think this is beautiful? Things like that, right? Um, and zero percent of those posts did asking the question actually raise engagement in any way. So two things to learn here. One, if you're asking questions and nobody's answering, like stop asking the question in your post because you become that person, right? Who's like, who wants to go to a party? And then like nobody answers. Um, so like, don't do that if nobody's answering. Now, if you are asking questions and you have engagement, great. But I challenge everybody to take a look at their, their, their own feed or their own wall. Look at how many times you've asked a question and then look at how many times a consumer has actually or a follower has actually answered that question. If you are in the majority, uh, it's less than 1%, right? Um, so that's an action item. That's, a, that's an example of actionable insight based on data. Um, almost half of our posts are asking questions with the intent to solicit engagement, probably because they heard that that's a good thing to do but they're not, they're not getting engagement. Um, and then the other actionable insight is start experimenting with your posts. Start putting up um, carousel posts versus single image posts. Start putting up posts with captions. Um, t the, what performs consistently uh, at a rate that is close to the single image post is just plain text, right? Like plain text and single image posts are the most underperforming uh, types of posts specifically within the real estate industry. Um, so take a look at that and, um, you know, adjust your social media plan accordingly. To, to just follow up to that real quick, I don't know if you have data on this, but is there any data about which platform tends to be the most effective to communicate over social? Sure. Well, it depends. I mean, and there's a lot of variables here, and I want to point that out too. Like, there's a lot of variables with engagement in terms of, you know, how aggressive is it. Like, some brands have more engaging followers by default due to their strategy. Um, some brands don't, some brands because of their reach have a higher uh, follower rate. So we tried to find ways to normalize the level of engagement based on those factors. Um, I can tell you that a lot of people are talking about TikTok right now for some reason. Uh, we, there is no measurable result there. Um, I think the answer to the question is what platform or what channel is the best or yields the most engagement. I think that's entirely dependent upon the strategy for that channel and the brand engaging. So what might be an answer for brokerage A might not be the answer for brokerage B. Um, I think the takeaway is to experiment and don't use anecdotal data, use hard data to tell you and inform you of what's working and what isn't. Right. I think it's an important point because I remember a couple of years ago, everybody said Snapchat was going to be the next thing when it came to marketing in real estate. And for some companies, maybe it did make a difference, others it didn't. So it's important to understand, it's not just there is a best platform, is there might be a best platform for your brand, testing it and then understanding the data um, when you're making your marketing decisions. But let's talk about homepage, because I know this is yes. a passion of yours. Let's talk about homepage. So first I will say this, back in 2007, which is three years after Zillow and Truly and the big portals came out, I was working for a broker in Brooklyn, New York, at the time the largest ND. And I begged and I pleaded, I practically got down on my knees and I said, please, 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 let's put a hero image on our homepage and a big obnoxious search bar because that's what we want people to use, right? And it took months of pleading and begging to be able to get the broker to agree with that until finally we did. And it was great because we saw an increase in engagement um, and, and an increase in our leads that were generated via the brokerage website, right? Um, that was 2007. And I think that uh, a lot of us are stuck in this idea when it comes to rebuilding our homepages, that if we do what the most popular real estate websites are doing, then we will emulate their success, right? And so uh, first I'd like to point out this, right? 15 milliseconds, this was a study done in, uh, actually in 2007, so the time has probably gone down. Um, 50 milliseconds 
which is like faster than the blink of an eye. That is, that's how much time you have to create a, 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 an impression of visual appeal to a consumer who's coming to your website, right? So I want that to sit in the back of everyone's mind is you have 50 milliseconds, that's it, right? Before somebody somewhere at some point in, their, in, in some part of their brain makes a decision about how they feel about your company, right? So let's think about that. And then let's think about this. Brand related searches account for six, over, over 65% of organic search volume across the 13 brokerages that we studied. Um, and so, you know, it's not all of the brokerages in the country, um, but in our, in our sample study, it was 13 brokerages and on average it accounted for 65.7% of their organic search volume. So we're getting rid of referral traffic. So anybody who's gone into their analytics was probably seeing a ton of referral traffic from Facebook, from Zillow, from Realtor, whatever the case may be. We're focusing specifically on people who came to your website because they searched for something, you showed up on Google and then they went to your page, right? Um, of overall website traffic, homepage traffic accounts for on average 14 and a half percent. I've seen it as low as 7%. I've seen it as high as 17, right? But what that tells me is that if you think about how many pages are on any real estate broker's website, there's thousands, right? Because you have your homepage, you have our about us, you have our team, you have our agents page, and then you've got like thousands of real estate listings, right? So 14 and a half percent on average is a pretty significant chunk of traffic going to your homepage, right? And now think about this. They got there more than likely because they Googled something like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make up a brokerage, uh, you know, neighborhood realty, right? So they Googled neighborhood realty uh, or they Googled Aaron Linkoff because he's an agent with neighborhood realty. Whatever the case may be, it was a brand related search. Why are they doing that? There's only two reasons. One, either an agent from that, uh, well, there's more than two, but the most likely are an agent either just left that person's living room because they went on a listing presentation and now that uh, consumer wants to learn more about the brokers because they, that agent just spent however much time they spent talking about why their brokerage is different than everyone else's and why you should list with me. Um, or, uh, you know, they, they are thinking about selling their home and they've seen your sign somewhere or they've seen an ad online. So they want to learn more about the company. So let's go through this process, right? On average, more than half of the people who are going to our brokerage websites are going there because they have specifically typed into Google something related to the brand, which indicates to us that they are wanting to learn more about the brand, right? Imagine this, you're, you're the third agent who, who sat uh, in the living room. So they're Googling uh, neighborhood realty, they're Googling city realty, and they're Googling, you know, nationwide realty, right? And, and they're getting the homepage uh, as like result number one or two on Google. So they're clicking that each time, right? Because they want to know what's different. And chances are they're seeing something that looks exactly like this, right? You've got a nice, beautiful picture of a home and, you know, some clever little caption that says home starts here or whatever the case may be. And your call to action is almost obnoxiously that big white search bar, right? What the data shows us is that less than one half of 1% of all website traffic results in an actual search that's executed um, on the homepage, okay? Um, furthermore, interesting, uh, we saw a little bit higher. We saw 3%, which was still really low. Um, but we were like, that's pretty high. We, we were expecting it to be less. So then what we did was we excluded traffic from, uh, that was coming from the real estate offices of the sites that we were studying. And that went down to less than one half of 1%. So more agents statistically are using that search on your brokerage website than the actual consumers are right? Which tells you what? Oh, they're looking to see how their listing is appearing on the website. They're doing their checks. They want to see what's going on. At the end of the day, you, if you have a website, and I think everybody needs to really think about this, if you have a website that looks in any way like this, then the message you are sending to the consumer who statistically got here because they wanted to learn what makes you different, the message you're sending is, we're not different at all. We have the same exact website with the same exact call to action, with the same exact property photo, maybe a lifestyle photo with pretty much the same exact things up in the menu that everybody else has. So now as a brokerage you're relying on the agent to be able to establish a relationship that is different enough to uh, want to, to make that consumer want to engage. And I think this is really important because we are dedicating a ton of real estate, no pun intended to this page. Why? And I think what we have to ask ourselves is 
what happens in, in a world where like the website just blew up, right? Like, oh my God, the servers went down. What are we going to do, right? You have to go and convince your broker, we've got to spend 50,000, 60,000, 150,000, whatever it is on a brand new website, right? The, questions, the question that the broker is going to ask is why? Why, why, why are we spending that much money on a website? Not because he doesn't believe we need to, but he needs to be able to justify the investment, right? Is the answer, oh, to generate leads? If that's your answer, please go back and examine how many leads your website is generating as a result of this design, right? Because chances are it's not generating a lot, right? So then the answer has to become, and this is where actionable insight comes into play, is we want to create, you know, we have an opportunity to, to, to make the consumer feel something, to elicit emotion that says, holy crap, like this is different. Like I feel something, right? Because this doesn't make anybody feel anything. This looks just like Zillow or Trulia or Realtor or fill in the blank, right? So we have an opportunity to actually create emotion within the consumer that will attach to your brokerage, to your brand. And that is far more powerful than like whatever leads you're getting from the one half of 1% on this page. Do you, so do you have examples or maybe uh, how, how you should be doing it? What's, what's a good example of what would be effective? Yeah. I think um, here, here's an example. So people are like, people might be asking, oh, if we don't have a big image on our homepage with a search bar, like what could we possibly do, right? So first I will say, before we go into this as an example, like think about, think about brands that instill some sense of passion or loyalty or uh, mystique, anything. Like what brands do you think of where you're like, ooh, right? Go to their website, stop looking at Zillow, stop looking at Trulia or whatever else, I mean, start looking at the websites that accomplish the goal that you're trying to accomplish as a brokerage, right? So here, this is a perfect example. Um, Real Living, which I believe is a, a brokerage in DC. Like, as you can see here, um, this, this really, really breaks the mold in terms of what design should look like, right? I, I, I don't know these people. I don't know the management or leadership there, but I would suspect that they went through the same process that we went through and said, we're not generating any leads. Like, what can we accomplish when we land on, when we, when a, a, a consumer lands on our homepage, right? Right away, it doesn't necessarily let the consumer know that this is a real estate brokerage, which I think a lot of people find important, but that doesn't matter. They got here because they Googled your brand. So they know your real estate brokerage. And so when they get here, you can see that they use CSS to sort of like create these animations in the background. And I'm scrolling right now. Yeah, I'm scrolling right now. And you can see that uh, this is what's happening. Like, wow. Right away, I don't know if this is a good real estate company or not. I really don't. But what I do know is that they took the time to make me feel something that no other real estate or few real estate company or brokerage websites can do, right? And so when we go here and we scroll down, you know, here's the properties. And I'm not saying get rid of your property search or anything like that. What I'm saying is reevaluate what your goals are of the web page, of your homepage above the fold. Um, I'd like to give a shout out, you know, to, to the group because here's an example. Now this is, this, this does follow the format of, of what we kind of were borderline disparaging uh, a moment ago. Um, but what they have done is this, this to me is a happy compromise, right? Because we're seeing lifestyle that search, which is right here, doesn't necessarily stand out as the go-to call to action, right? Like I'm feeling good. Um, I know that Tom and, and everybody over there at the group in Fort Collins, like uh, they're, they're really focused on lifestyle and, and their agents probably pitch that and their brand pitches that. So I'm getting a really good lifestyle vibe here, you know, Northern Colorado, um, COVID-19. I might even miss this as I'm scrolling through the search bar. So that to me is like a healthy compromise. And then I think there was one other one, um, that, that you had brought up, Aaron. Uh, what was it? Uh, it might be another Washington DC one. You know, it'd be interesting to also look at is what is, when we talk about Compass does a good job with brand alignment. I think they might break the mold on what you're talking about too, though. Well, well here's the thing. Compass, I know for a fact, has what we're talking about, right? Like they have this and then the search bar. Um, but, I also happen to know that they generate a ton of leads to their site. Sure. So if you're generating a ton of leads to your site, which requires large capital investment um, and resources, then by all means, continue to do what Compass and Zillow and everybody else is doing. However, 
If you're in the majority of brokerages who maybe only have one or two people on the team, and then you're relying on a platform to be able to provide your website, challenge your team to come up with an idea that actually accomplishes tangible goals that are achievable via your homepage, and also challenge your platform provider um, to be able to coach you and consult with you and provide a template that allows you to um, accomplish those goals. The one I was thinking of is City Chic. It's another uh, DC, smaller DC company. C-H-I, yeah, real estate. So they also get away from the hero image and... Right, right. So right away, it's, it's a call to action, book a call, right? Let's get smart about your future. Um, this paints a really nice picture of what the brokerage is about and really sets them apart from uh, any other DC area brokerages they might be um, competing against. So the, the idea is that what worked back in 2007, I think we can all agree as business marketing practices and in general, as the culture has changed, it's reasonable to say what worked back in 2007 might not necessarily be the best way of doing things now. And especially with the popularity of Zillow and Redfin who typically capture the organic home search uh, uh, um, uh, traffic, that looking at your website, you should look at it as more of an opportunity to communicate the difference that your brand has and not necessarily as a spot people are going to, to do home search um, because everybody else seems to have that. And it's important to utilize that as the face of the company that most people are going to see mostly because they heard your name already or they heard it or, or they've talked to an agent already that are as that company. It's not necessarily gonna be organic. 100%, and, and to your point, it's an excellent opportunity because uh, if I were to bet on what the standard real estate brokerage website looks like three years from now, it looks like this, and it looks like this, and it looks like what we're talking about. So I think everyone has the opportunity to get in on the ground floor and create that initial distinction before the next trend comes along, uh, at which point you can hop on the ground floor then. But try to be ahead, try to stay ahead of the game, um, but more than anything else, look at the data. If you have a big white search bar on your homepage with the hero image and a generic caption, how is that working for you? And if it isn't, you need to change it. Super helpful. The whole idea is what we're doing wrong based on the data. So you got a couple of things here we're doing wrong that we could be doing better. Um, please, if you have questions, because Zane is uh, you know, a, a pro at data analysis. He's clearly been in the industry for a long time. If there's anything, any questions that you have on how to be thinking about this, how to be thinking about data analytics, all of that kind of good stuff, please post it on here in the Q&A. Um, I know we're running up on time here. Um, one last uh, quick question I have for you. Most brokerages, most companies are not data analysts. They don't have a data analyst in-house necessarily. Sure. And of course you could hire one. They're very hard to get, by the way. If you find one, grab them. But what are steps that companies can be taking right now to get close to what we're talking about here? If we can, if, if we understand that we're not all data analysts coming out of here, yep. what are ways we can start moving in that direction to start understanding, capturing the right data and understanding it so it's actually functional for, for these companies? Sure. I think everybody should have, you know, I'm guessing everybody has, you know, Google Analytics installed on their site. If not, it's something else. Um, Challenge yourself to learn like the fundamentals of what Google Analytics can do. Um, don't just look at the uh, don't just look at the bounce rate and your traffic and and then move on, right? Like learn how to actually segment data so that you can draw information that will allow you to uh, enact actionable insight. Um, first and foremost, ask yourself, even as an agent, right? Because I know agents love to have agent websites. Ask yourself why do I have this website? And it's going to be, you know, the, there's going to be two very common answers. One is to generate leads. Two is to tell people more about me. And uh, if your answer to that question is the latter, whether you're a broker or an agent, let me tell you, nobody's going to your site. Well, some people are, but the vast majority of people aren't going to your site and going to the about me or the about us section, right? They're formulating their opinion based on what they see. And you're saying so much about you when you have a website that looks exactly like everyone else's. Um, and three, whoever you're, whether you're building your website in-house or you're engaged with one of the many great platform providers that we have in this industry, ask them the hard questions, right? Can we have a chat about 
how many leads our website is generating. Uh, if it's not up to par, what can we do to increase that number? And a lot of times the answer is going to be, oh, we can spend money on ads. We can do an SEO campaign. We can do that. That all requires time, money, and resources. Um, if you have none of those or limited amounts, then say to yourself, what can I accomplish? And many times the answer will be, uh, we can accomplish the, the goal of setting or creating sentiment within the consumer in a way that no other brokerage in our market is. Um, and, and that is the definition of innovating by design. Um, design is very, very important. Um, and we have a chance to innovate via design at this moment in time. And, and that, those would be, I think, the first steps. Um, and, and coming up with some actionable insight that would be useful to either your agent website or your brokerage website. Perfect. To jump to some of the questions here, um, Sarah asks, what have you found is a good open rate and click-through rate for email marketing? And I can preface with uh, what MailChimp puts out as industry average for real estate is 19% open rate and a 1.77% click-through rate. Yeah. So when you're thinking about this same for email marketing, what do you consider to be success? Well, success isn't necessarily uh, ideal, right? Because like success when rolling out a platform to a brokerage is 25% adoption, right? Like that's one out of four people using a platform. Is that what we want? No, we want 75, 80%, a hundred ideally. So success when it comes to things as simple as email marketing, um, I know for a fact and not to, uh, you know, um, kind of blow active pipe up a little bit, but I know for a fact that active pipe emails on average outperform constant contact, um, MailChimp, uh, some of the other stuff, you know, we've seen, and, and I've had the pleasure of, uh, uh, rolling out active pipe for a couple of different brokerages. Um, we've seen click through rates as high as 30%. Um, like that's amazing. Um, we've seen open rates as high as a even some of these were internal communications, but for some campaigns, and again, the platform in, in and of itself isn't going to boost your uh, open engagement rates. Like content is important here. One thing that hasn't changed over the last 13 years is that content is still king. Um, we just have to determine what that king of content is. Um, but I think if you can, if you can get a 25% click through rate, and upwards of a 35 to 50% open rate, that's phenomenal. Good insights. And, and Sarah, I appreciate you asking that question because it got, got Zane saying nice things about ActivePipe, so thank you. Um, Tamia asks, hey Tamia, how you doing? Uh, yeah. What does Zane think is more valuable data for brokerage growth, consumer data or agent data? Great question. Mm. Uh, well, it depends on what the growth strategy is, right? If the growth strategy is, um, you know, close more transactions by generating more leads, then consumer data in that case would be more important. If the growth strategy is we need to build our brokerage and the only way to do that is to get more agents because by getting more agents, uh, we can get more listings and close more sides, um, then it would be agent data that would be more viable. So I think first is establishing the process by which you intend to grow. And it could be two pronged. It could be both of those things. Um, but I think, to Tamia's point, agent data, both in terms of production and in terms of productivity and engagement within the company, um, all can, that, that data contains a, a load of things that can help us determine, A, uh, what agents are more likely to be ready to leave a, a brokerage, whether it be your own or somebody else's, and B, um, what markets you can start to look at expanding into as a result of growth that is identifiable by data, but isn't necessarily the word on the street yet. Great question. Great question. So it's all about typically figure out what the end goal is first, and then you'll know which data is more important. And then how do you yes. actually analyze that data for the end goal? But most importantly, what, that's all correct. But most importantly, do not make the mistake of fitting the data into your end goal, right? Have your end goal over here, have your data over here, and then figure out how you bridge that gap. But the worst mistake you could possibly make is taking that data and, and, and shoving it into the end goal that you have in mind, because then that defeats the whole purpose of data analytics and creating actionable insight. Right, like what you said, data in itself doesn't discriminate, but how we interpret it and understand it can. Absolutely. Um, one other uh, question from Steven. Hey, Steve, how's it going? Uh, what database stack do you use for MLS data and visualization? 
Well, me personally, uh, data, database stack. Um, so I get raw data from the MLS, and so it's my own database that I've created, and I visualize it uh, through my own programs. Um, Google Data Studio, or Data Studio is a really good one. Um, uh, Tablet's another really good one, um, or Tableau rather. Um, but for you know, you're running the mill. If you're not looking at you know creating scripts that you know can ingest just boatloads of raw MLS data to go into a, a database that you built to be able to query and create visualizations for, really your options are kind of limited. Um, Trend Graphics has always been out there um, as a as a good resource for MLS data, um, and various MLSs across the country have their own version of that in partnership with other vendors. Um, so I would say. Uh, if, if you have something like trend graphics or there's another one and the name is escaping me right now, but if you have something within your own respective MLS, uh, that allows you to compile data from the MLS, um, and it's reliable, then just use that because, um, that's going to be the most effective resource available to you. Um, and there are times where I have sat there because I didn't have the data myself where I've manually created databases based on information that was coming to me from programs like trend graphics, you know, line by line, just punching it in there. And sometimes that's what data analysis, uh, data analysis is, is spending four hours manually transferring over data into a database because that's what's going to be most useful for you. Awesome. Great question. Well, we're coming up on time here. And, um, one question I like to end with, um, We've been noticing during this quarantine, a lot of people have been picking up pretty interesting hobbies. Myself, I've been mm -hmm. trying to ferment hot peppers and failing. Um, mm -hmm. Have you picked up any interesting quarantine hobby? Uh, I have actually two of them. One is gardening. Um, so uh, I, I find that that is in direct contradiction, uh, both philosophically and just patience wise with many of my other hobbies and core personality attributes. Um, so it brings me peace, uh, to, to see tomatoes blossom okay, from the vine. Gardening. Yeah. And then, uh, woodworking. Um, I've really gotten into, uh, woodworking and, uh, fabricating things, um, much to the dismay of, uh, my household members, because now anytime we need to buy something, I first insist that I build it first, um, so that we can save some money and I can expand upon my woodworking skills. So all the early stuff, maybe a little bit wobbly, but at least yeah. Great. Like like my bed frame right now uh, probably <laughs> looks good, but uh, every time I sneeze, it squeaks, and I'm afraid that it's going to fall apart. But soon enough, uh, maybe I'll open an Etsy shop and sell. There you uh, go. Yeah. And then you can get a Zane original. You heard it here first. There we go. There we go. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time. This has been super interesting. We plan to have Zane on again because he has a ton of knowledge in just multiple different areas here. Uh, so definitely tune in when we send out uh, the next subject we'll be talking about here. But Zane, thanks again. And everybody with uh, this recording will be sent out. So send it around and uh, please send us questions if you have them. And uh, thank you all for joining. Appreciate it, Zane. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Awesome. Take it easy. All right. Be good.